All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our worship service. Welcome to you who are here in person, of course. Good to see a lot of folks. And uh, those of you joining us, uh, about a, it looks like about uh, 15 or so folks online. So welcome. Thanks for joining in that way. Sure good to see you on this Super Bowl Sunday. A big game coming up. Everyone got big plans? Anyone going anywhere, doing anything? No, some people don't even care. Yeah, I get it. LA and Cincinnati. Uh, sometimes it's fun to watch those ones where you have nobody to really root for because, you know, okay, well, hopefully it's just a good, good game and maybe the commercials are funny or something, you know? All right. Yes, welcome. Sure appreciate you all being here. Our, uh, just a little preview. We have another First Corinthians uh, sermon in our series coming up here in just a little bit. Uh, the bell choir playing during our special music time. Exciting. We waited for that. And today, Michelle Stedman is our liturgist, so she will kick us off with some gathering words. Thank you, Michelle. There you are. Poor, poor or des despairing, come to be blessed. Sorrowing or sighing, come to discover joy. Share your hopes, your dreams. Come as you are. Is from the hymnal, hymn number 702, Sing with all the saints in glory.
At this time, we will open up the floor for the sharing of some joys and concerns. If you're joining us online, of course, uh, please uh, leave some of those in the comment section there if you'd like us to share those. Um, we'll make sure to write them down definitely, even if we miss them, and uh, be in prayers for that. Uh, but uh, if you here in person and want to raise your hand, I'll come around with a uh, microphone and then you can share your joys and concerns with us. I'll go here and then over here. Michelle Stedman. Um, my mom had surgery about five or six weeks ago and she um, has had some complications with that. She had to be in the hospital for a week, couple, uh, like three weeks ago, because she had an inf a really bad infection. Um, but she's doing better now. She has one tubing of dra for draining left um, in her that she's going to be take, getting taken out hopefully soon. Thank you. All right. Good update. We'll be in prayers for her for sure. Here you are. Thank you. Liz Chavez, um, a joy that our Michelle is feeling well enough to be back with yeah. us. She's been, she's been missing for a while. Uh, prayers for Steve Thomas, the executive director of Family Promise. He, uh, his family has been experiencing some uh, difficulties with their daughter, Brooke, and Steve is not feeling too well. So prayers for him. He has an appointment in Spokane. And then prayers for a couple of friends up on the prairie. Gary and Janelle Wilson are both, both have cancer, different kinds, um, and, and they're, they're coming along and they've got good docs, but um, prayers for them. They're not exactly young anymore, and so coming back from things is not always easy. Thank you. Rita Mills. I have several this morning. Um, Patty has a friend, Kathy Vaughn, and she and her husband have been struggling for the last couple of years, and now Vaughn has been has having problems in the ureter and that area, and I'm not sure of all the details. And also, I have a friend who lives in Portland, a young gal that has four small children, and she is having breast surgery for cancer on Thursday. So this prayers for them, if you could please. All right, I will share an update from Billy. Uh, we've been praying for Colleen, uh, Colleen with a Gillian Barr syndrome. G Gillian Barre, <laughs> I always get it wrong. Guillaume Barre, okay. <laughs> I knew there was a French way to, to do it. And anyway, this, so the update is she's able to move a hand and a foot. She doesn't have control of those though. Um, still basically paralyzed, her body is trying to come back. She's off the ventilator and the feeding tubes are gone. Um, now in a regular room and will be moved to a rehab center closer to home soon. So um, the, the physicians are pretty amazed at how she's doing uh, so, so far. So uh, let's continue to keep Colleen in our prayers during that process. Any other? Okay. All right, if you would, please join me in a pastoral prayer and then all together for a version of the Lord's Prayer. God, we come before you, our hearts laid open and bare before you with all that we have to offer, the good, the bad, the joy, the sorrow mixed together. We lift up to you as we come together for worship uh, and in praise. Lord, we are grateful for so many things, but at the same time, we also have so many uh, burdens that we lift up to you now and tr we trust uh, those into your care Lord, we think of those who are still hospitalized and still working through surgeries or upcoming surgeries um, Lord I wasn't able to write all these down but you heard all these um, requests and so we think of those who are facing operations waiting to hear news and updates uh, we pray for their peace of mind as they um, are waiting to hear those things. We pray for wisdom and we pray for peace. Lord, those who are coming out of uh, different illnesses or still right in the middle of them, we pray for recovery, we pray for wholeness, we pray for strength, and we pray for mercy. Uh, Lord, we do also pray that as a uh, community, as a church, we would uh, feel these burdens for each other and help each other carry them together. 
uh, in prayer, of course, throughout this week, um, but also with phone calls and with our presence, Lord, in many different ways. Uh, give us the gifts and the ability to share of our time and to be there for one another. Lord, we uh, continue to pray for uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, it seems to be in a low spot now. We've, we've gone through a big surge. We pray, Lord, for brighter days ahead, and we pray for continued uh, vigilance for each other's safety and health, and for those who are still working hard, hard um, over time uh, and burdened with just lack of energy and so many things. We pray that we would do all that we can to help uh, during a time when perhaps people can recover a bit and restore and renew themselves. And Lord, we offer all this up to you now. We hand it into your uh, control. We know, Lord, that um, there's not a lot that we can do, but Lord, we offer it to you and pray that what we can do, you give us the power and the strength and the courage to do as we work through so many different things. And Lord, now we come together and we pray a version of what you taught us to pray, saying, God, lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you, to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offenses as we forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole. Amen. All right, and uh, Michelle will come forward for our scripture reading today from 1 Corinthians 15. The Resurrection of the Dead. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are, all of, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Namaste. My name is Catherine Parker, and it is my joy to be your covenant missionary, serving here with the United Mission to Nepal. This week, I've been out in far western Nepal, connecting with communities and our projects here during this brief window that we've had between the Delta and Omicron waves of COVID-19. What a... <laughs> challenging two years it has been for us. I spent the first year of COVID uh, working remotely from my home in California, and then I spent the next eight months working remotely from my apartment in Kathmandu. But I'm so glad to be out again connecting with people here in the community. Today has been an amazing visit. Uh, we were out at a birthing center here, and we got to meet with Deepa Chandri, and the pride that she showed uh, in being able to serve her community now that she has completed her skilled birth attendant training. The ability for women just in the nearby area to come to a birthing center uh, within walking distance of their homes rather than engaging in long travel gave her great pride in being able to serve. We also met with a farmer's group who after their local grain mill closed down 
formed a cooperative of 51 families to start a new cooperative mill. And we got to see uh, they've got both a rice mill uh, for husking, a, a wheat mill for grinding flour, and an oil mill. Uh, they've built up a wonderful shed for protecting that, and they're working so well together. We also got to visit the COVID hospital here in this rural municipality, where United Mission to Nepal has supported uh, three oxygen concentrators as well as five beds and medicines to help the people who have moderate cases to be able to be treated and recover here in their own community again rather than needing to travel uh, to the faraway hospitals. While these have been challenging times, it is such a joy to see the ways in which communities continue to work together and continue to support each other to really live into our vision of fullness of life for all in a transformed Nepali society. Thank you for being part of this journey with me. Namaste. Thank you for that to uh, Bell Choir. Always a treat to hear them uh, perform. Play a little special piece. Uh, if you were wondering, that was uh, Catherine Parker giving a little bit of an update. Catherine Parker, uh, the Clarkston uh, United Methodist Church sponsors her as a missionary, but all um, uh, Pacific Northwest Conference churches also sponsor uh, through a, a roundabout way by giving t to the um, UMCOR and things like that. So uh, missions response. So that was her February update. Uh, and we appreciate her sharing that with us. All right, so here we are. We're in uh, 1 Corinthians once again. One more, maybe two more weeks. I, I'm, I'm not sure entirely yet what I'm going <laughs> to do next week. Sometimes I have a great big plan, and sometimes those plans get redirected a bit. But I think pretty sure at least once, uh, one more week probably. Um, but we are here in 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to remind you of the context a little bit of the letter. When we picked it up, we were already at uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, famous chapter, love is patient, love is kind, all those things. And I wanted to make sure you knew the context that Paul was writing that to. He was writing it to a community who was going through some division, who was going through some upheaval, uh, kind of like a divorce type of situation. And so he was really trying to emphasize for them their arguments seem to be centered on who's more important, whose roles and gifts are better in the community. Uh, really the type of, um, of arguments that can derail any relationship from a marriage type relationship to friendships. Well, who's more important? Or I think of myself more important. So, you know, those types of things. Uh, Paul really wanted to stress, listen, your roles, your gifts, all those things are important. They're necessary, they're needed, but
but they're all going to kind of fade. There are going to be some things, though, that, that stay throughout it all. Faith, hope, and love. And love is the most important one. It's the thing that will hold you together. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And last week we talked about Paul stressing here, this is the thing, the very first original thing that holds you together. Um, the teaching about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and how hold firm to that. Believe that is true. And in your relationships, you'll see it come true if you believe that, if you put that first. Death, burial, resurrection, if you honor that and hold firm to that, how it will dictate the rest of your relationships. So you'll start to kind of treat each other Yes, still be, there will still be some division, but love should reign first. Well, this week, he really drills in hard on the idea of resurrection. In fact, leading up to this point in the letter, he's been very diplomatic. He hasn't singled anyone out. He hasn't called anyone out by name in this church who's having issues and division and fighting. But in this portion of the letter, he seems to... A little bit pull the gloves off and say and in particular one argument that you're having centers on the belief of the resurrection and some of you are arguing or you know you don't quite comprehend or understand it it doesn't make much sense to you you're maybe wondering if we can just toss it aside is it that important that we have it figured out and he really pulls the glove off and says listen this is this is one of the most important things this idea of resurrection is um, for us the most important idea. And if it's not true, if we throw it out, kind of everything starts to fall apart a little bit, you know? And so he's really stressing this. He's really drilling down hard into it. In fact, he, he begins to engage a little bit in what we ministers, people who stand up, who teach, who argue or debate or offer thoughts and ideas, he starts to engage in circular logic a little bit. <laughs> he starts to kind of chase his own tell a little bit with what he's talking about. So in chapter 12, he lays out, okay, some of you have roles, some of you have gifts, some of you have these abilities, those are important. He encourages them to discover what theirs might be, um, but to do so in love. That was chapter 13. But here he starts to, he gets so, so he wants to convey, I'm so flummoxed by this argument that you're having over resurrection that it's causing me to go in circles I'm so confused over why you do this. He's struggling to make his point. If I could, I, I'm going to try to boil down Paul's circular logic a bit. Uh, he kind of goes like this. Basically, if Christ is raised, so he already begins there, just assume Christ is raised, how can you say there's no resurrection? If there is no resurrection, then Christ hasn't been raised. You see how the circle's already starting. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is in vain. If the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. But Christ has been raised. And that's the abbreviated version. But you can see he's, he's wandering around in circles a little bit. You know, he's trying to lay out a, um, a passionate plea for them to hold firm to this. So what is he getting at here? Why is Paul engaging in this? Paul's not a dummy. Paul is, when it comes to reason and logic, he's very well schooled and versed. So I know he knows he's engaging in a circular argument. So what is he getting at here? Is he, uh, is he laying out a systematic theology about resurrection? Is he explaining the science behind it and how it all works? I don't think so. Is he wanting to provide the opportunity to lay out a convincing and rational argument? Because listen, let me tell you, I don't think that that's true, because try this. Go try this on people and see if they're like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Sure, yes, resurrection, yeah, that makes total sense. So I don't think that's what he's trying to do here. I don't believe he's actually engaging in a rational argument, and he's doing that on purpose. I think he's wanting them to see resurrection is something that defies <laughs> rationality. It goes beyond it. There's, there's things that we can make sense of logically. But there are some things in life that don't, you can't quite capture <laughs> in a logical, rational way. Uh, this is where poetry <laughs> comes into play. Telling good stories come into play. This is where um, cultures have engaged for centuries in, in storytelling 
as a way to sort of get your mind around certain ideas and thoughts and beliefs. Paul here is saying, basically, uh, is getting to a point where you don't believe this. We don't believe this because it necessarily makes sense in a rational, logical way. We believe it because we've experienced it. We've lived it. It's true in life whether you can wrap your mind around it or not. Now, there's a, an Irish philosopher, his name's Peter Rollins, and he is in a school of philosophy and theology. It's called Radical Philosophy and Theology, and it's very complicated. It's very, there's lots of mazes and twists and turns, and it's really more of an exercise of like how, um, <laughs> how can we uh, exercise our minds and get it twisty and turny and still somehow arrive at something. So I won't try to get into what that is. Um, but it is very interesting. It's, it's kind of fun to tackle a little bit, but it also will leave you walking away going, ugh, ugh. there's just too much you know, going on there, the twists and the turns and the ins and outs. But um, Peter Rollins, he, in fact, he will sometimes, uh, for Lent, he, will, he does this exercise where he, you know, for Lent you give up you know, something uh, for 40 days leading up to Easter. He, a lot of years, it's kind of interesting, he does it as a practice, as a discipline, recognizing that over the time he starts to develop beliefs about God that he's like very comforted by but may not be true. <laughs> so for Lent, he's, he gives up those beliefs. Can I still pursue and follow God if I give up these things that I've uh, I just, maybe I believe because I want to, you know, for my own selfish reasons, <laughs> you know what I'm kind of talking about? Anyway, that's the type of thing he does. But I can remember, I, I'm just laying the, this out for you who he is because I want to give you an answer he gave one time when he was asked at a conference, he was speaking, and somebody in the crowd said, so if I'm following you right, <laughs> do you, here's my question, do you deny the resurrection or do you affirm it i'm not sure because he was you know twisted twisty stuff and he said i can stand up here and i can say and i have no problem admitting that i do deny the resurrection and you do too you deny the resurrection whenever you do not serve the least of these you deny the resurrection when you do not sit at the feet of the most oppressed in our society and do some service or ministry for them. When you look the other way, you deny, I deny the resurrection when I have a chance to offer forgiveness and I withhold it from the other person. I deny it all the time, <laughs> unfortunately, but I affirm the resurrection the few times in my life when I've, been, when I've been able to and have actually done it, when I serve the least, the oppressed, when I refuse to participate in a system that leads to death and injustice, when I offer forgiveness to somebody who needs forgiveness, I affirm the resurrection. And so you see what he's doing here is he's taking the idea of thinking about the resurrection as something in the past, maybe, or something that might happen in the future, I'm not sure. What he's saying is in the here and now and today, here are the ways that I affirm or deny resurrection. I think this is kind of why Paul is stressing this so important, that for today, how are you living as if resurrection is true? It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't even matter what you think. If in your life you are not giving affirmation to the resurrection through your actions, how can love be put on display <laughs> if you're not living resurrection in your everyday life? Um, another person who gave a great answer, his name was Bishop Corrigan, when he was asked about, um, he was preaching on uh, Trinity uh, Sunday, uh, which kind of leading up to Easter and after worship, someone came up to him and asked, Bishop Corrigan, do you really believe the resurrection? I've, I wrestle with it all the time. And uh, Bishop Corrigan 
without skipping a beat, says, absolutely, yes, I believe in the resurrection. I've seen it too many times not to. I've seen it too many times. You know, you and I can wrestle back and forth with the ins and the outs and the science about what happens with Christ's body and what happens with your body someday. But you know what's more, I think, telling is what we do in the here and the now today with our lives. Do you deny or do you affirm the resurrection today? What will you do today to affirm or deny? Uh, Right now, as of today, we are what? Almost a million people dead in our country from COVID. Five and a half million across the world. At the same time, teenagers every day dying from suicide or in school, shooting or abuse at home. Every day, children are abused. Every day, neighbors experience loneliness, neglect, rejection. You don't have to look very far to find deep grief and loss and death all around us. And so, what are you doing in the middle of all that to share the hope of resurrection? Not someday, today. I don't want to minimize or downplay death and devastation. It happens. It's, it's, it's all around us. But I also wonder if, if we simply named it, if we lamented even aloud over it, if we cried out to God with honesty about our pain, and I wonder if we wouldn't be able then to begin to help ourselves trust that God can take all of that death and give birth to new life in us, among us, and around us. Um, Another person put it like this, Ron Lucky, and I love how he puts it. He says, the resurrection is about more than a fortunate Jewish rabbi being raised from the dead. It's about the whole world being raised from the dead when he was raised. It gives us the hope that the way things have always been will not always be because Jesus is alive. Resurrection is about today, too. Amen? Um, you know, I, I think because we believe in this, if we say we believe in this, we think this, because Christ has been risen, I think we have to believe, whether we try whether, even if we're not able to explain it, Paul, in his circular logic, not able very well to explain it, it doesn't matter. Do you live it? In the middle of despair, when you're convinced you can't go on, when you have a moment to offer forgiveness, will you live the resurrection? Will you live it? I, I, in my life, I can't even begin to describe all of the times, whenever, whatever it might be, whatever I've done that was shameful, whatever I've done that was full of guilt, whatever I've done that was um, just terrible, awful, I've experienced resurrection in those moments. And I know you know what I'm talking about for you too. You've experienced it too. Um, I can remember one of the very first times I experienced it. I was pretty young. I was seven or eight years old. I think I've shared this story before, but a friend and I um, wandered into the, they were building a new post office in our little tiny town, and the old post office was abandoned. It was open. Somebody had already gone in there and kind of forced open the door. My friend and I wandered in there. It was already torn up in disarray, but we found a box of silver dollars, you know, lots of them, a full big box, and they were old. 1800s and we were excited we're like we are taking these things and we did we came up with a story about how we found it and we went around and we told that story to my mom to my friend's mom to other people in the town you know because we wanted to make sure we had a good story about how we found these silver dollars we didn't want to tell the truth that we'd gotten them from the post office you know Uh, of course I felt terrible though especially when I told my mom the lie. And I can remember laying in bed that night 
just being torn up. It felt like, well, I don't know, I, I've not experienced death yet, but it felt like a part of me was dying. And I felt terrible, and I felt awful. And I walked out there, <laughs> and I told my mom what we had done. And my mom, you know, gave me my first taste of resurrection. She didn't, you know, of course I was in trouble. But she also told me, thank you for being, you know, eventually honest with me and coming and telling me, you are forgiven. And it just felt like, I, it didn't matter what came next. It just felt like, <sighs> new life. It's not over. My life isn't over. I have a new chance. And so accountability still happened, of course. We had to go clean the post office um, up as part of the community service. Even though we didn't mess it up, but it was still, we, you know, that was a part of our deal. So we did it. And uh, I just, it was like new day, new, I just felt good, you know. And you all have experienced those things too in your life. So my question is, what are you doing to help other people experience that too? Because we all need it. You might have, right now, today, there might be a neighbor next door to you, across the street from you, who is lonely. These two years have been lonely, lonely times for a lot of people. What are you doing to help them experience resurrection, and you too, at the same time? Or there could be somebody in your family that you know you need to ask them for forgiveness or you need to offer them forgiveness. What are you doing to help resurrection happen in that? What are you going to do today? Because it matters today. Not a thousand years from now, what's going to happen to your body. Not a thousand years ago, what happened to Christ's body. What are you doing today to make it real? Today there's a great big football game. Maybe you do have that lonely neighbor across the street and they need somebody to watch the big game with. What are you doing today? Today. Um, so I suspect you know um, exactly what I'm talking about. I expect you know about forgiveness. You've received a second chance yourself. But I want to know what are you going to do today to bring God's transforming, resurrecting love in your midst? Because for, with God, all things are made new, including you, including today. Amen? Let's, let's make the most of it. Let's affirm and not deny resurrection today. Let's pray. God, we offer ourselves up to you. We pray, Lord, today that we would take the opportunities that we have to affirm resurrection. No longer denying resurrection. It doesn't matter what we say we believe or think. But God, what can we do today with our actions to show resurrection love with our neighbors, with our families? Or what can we do to help make it happen in our own lives? Or give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to do so today. We love you, God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, offering time. Um, if you're joining us online, let me just remind you of a couple ways that you can, uh, you can give um, if you're not with us in person. But if you are here in person, Liz is going to walk around with the uh, offering plate. So if you're online with us, you can mail in a check. There's the addresses. You can write those down. Uh, if you're with the Clarkson Church, there's the address. If you're with the Lewiston Church, there's the address. Um, another way you can give is you can just drop them off at the office. Just call ahead and make sure somebody's in the office. I know uh, office hours are a little bit different, I think, this week or maybe next week. Uh, just double check. Call in and, and find out. Uh, or you can do online giving. Both churches have a way to do this. The Clarkson Church is the big green button over in the right-hand corner. Just click that and you can give. Or for the Lewiston Church, also over on the right-hand side, you just hit that Contact Us button drop down and hit that donate tab. Both churches also have uh, mobile apps you can put on your smartphone so you can give anytime from anywhere. Uh, for Clarkson, it's the Tithely app, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Just put it on your phone, search for Clarkson UMC, and then give however you want to that way. Or for Lewiston, it's the Vancom mobile giving app. Put that on your phone, search for the First United Methodist Church, and use the one in 
Lewis than Idaho. I mean, you can give that way. All right. Now, a special giving focus today that I want to draw your attention to. Um, you don't have to give it today, but the uh, LC Valley YWCA has their soup fundraiser, the big annual soup fundraiser uh, going on, and I'm going to give you some more information on that during announcements, but if you have some extra money, hold on to that and use it for the soup fundraiser. That's how they uh, fund their shelters. It's like the bulk of the way they fund their shelters there at the YWCA. Okay, let's pray for the offering, and then uh, we'll move on to... Uh, closing song and announcements. God, we thank you for this offering given today. Um, we pray, Lord God, that it would be blessed and used to help others experience resurrection in their lives. Um, allow, allow us as a congregation to affirm resurrection with the way we use these funds. God, we love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song today is from the hymnal, hymn number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Maybe say that just a couple of announcements real quick before our benediction. Uh, this is, uh, of course, DVDs, audio, always available. Let us know if there's any um, special service you'd like 
a sermon, a children's moment, a song, a special music, let us know. We'll make sure to get you uh, that in any form you want, DVD, MP3, so on and so forth. All right, now I mentioned this during the offering time. This is the uh, um, soup, support our shelters for the YWCA. This is their annual thing they do. Um, and if you go ahead and hit the next slide, there's a few ways you can participate, okay? There's the online bull auction that starts tomorrow. This is why I'm telling you, it starts tomorrow. It goes from 9 a.m. to Friday at 9 p.m. And uh, you can bid online for um, some exclusive handmade soup bowls. I think it features seven local artists that handcrafted these bowls, and the opening bids start at 25. But on Friday, there's an in-person soiree auction at, what is that, nine, uh, five, yeah, 5 p.m., $25 a ticket, and you get to bid on 10 exclusive. You can only get them at, this on, at the in-person event. Uh, 10 exclusive bowls. There's going to be uh, beer, some wine, some hors d'oeuvres, and some music from uh, Lorinda uh, Bisso. And then the main event is the soup pickup on February 25th, 11 to 2. That's where they'll be handing out the soup. Um, there's no in-person dining for that. Uh, you go, you pick it up, and uh, do whatever. Or you can have it delivered, and that's the important part. You can uh, pay for delivery tickets online, $25, but the uh, delivery ones have to be bought by February 21st. So you can go to their website, ywcaidaho.org, slash events, slash support our shelters, and uh, get your tickets to any one of those events the online auction starting tomorrow is through their Facebook page. All right, so just heads up on that. Great uh, ministry going on in our valley there. So um, definitely check that out and get involved. All right, I think that's it for announcements that I have. Is there any out there that you want to make sure we remember? Men's uh, Coffee, 9.30 Wednesday here in the Fellowship Hall. Remember that. Sunday school, going strong, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, today was week number two, so um, be there for that next week. Anything else? All right, I think that's it. So let me send you off with a benediction. Go to bring blessings. Go to be blessings. Peace be with you. Thank you.